We're going to study the muscles and vessels that are associated with the shoulder region. And what we're looking at here is a posterior view of the two shoulders. Uh, this is the dissection as we left it when we did the laminectomies. We're going to be looking at the first the muscles on the posterior side and then we'll be looking at the muscles on the anterior side. There really are only two incisions that you have to make for this dissection and these are to cut the muscles which are attached to the scapular spine. So as you can see here we have the deltoid muscle and of course it's going to be attached to the clavicle, to the acromion, and to the scapular spine so that you want to make an incision that comes around the top of that muscle so that we can reflect it from its bony attachments. And the second muscle which has to be cut is the trapezius which you can see right here. That portion of it which is inserting on the scapular spine from above also has to be cut and we've already done this and I'm going to reflect the trapezius muscle so that we can look at some of the muscles which lie beneath. Now of course the trapezius muscle is a mover of the shoulder girdle meaning that it attaches to the scapula and does not attach to the humerus. So this is one of the muscles which move the shoulder girdle, the trapezius, and when we reflect the trapezius there are going to be two other muscles that we can see which are extending over to the cut spinous processes and these are going to be the rhomboids. So we have the rhomboid muscle here which is going to be deep to the trapezius. It's going to be inserting along the vertebral border of the scapula. And just proximal to the rhomboid muscle is the levator scapulae. It also is coming from cervical vertebra and it's coming down to attach to this angle of the scapula up here so it moves only the shoulder girdle. In order to see some of the muscles which are deep to the deltoid we want to reflect it uh, after having cut it from its proximal attachments and we're looking at this from the posterior aspect and as I bring it forward one of the things that you're going to be looking at is a portion of the triceps muscle here this is the teres minor here and coming out just underneath the teres minor muscle is going to be the innervation and nerve supply of the deltoid and of course you saw these in a previous dissection as the posterior humeral circumflex and the axillary nerve so that they are winding around the humerus to enter the body of the deltoid at this point. After you've moved the deltoid, uh, this allows you to look at some of the muscles which are attached to the scapula, that is arising from the scapula, and moving over to the humerus, which is right here. So the head of the humerus is right here beneath the acromion, which is right there. Now there are two muscles which are located just inferior to the spine of the scapula and this meaty area in here is all the infraspinatus. Now there's usually a small line of fat which runs along here and you will look for that because that will allow you to separate the really small teres minor from the infraspinatus which is right here. So in doing that, that's about all that you can do to separate these two muscles. Both of them are coming over here to insert on the humerus. And then just inferior to the teres minor is going to be the larger and bulkier teres major, which would be right here. And once again, there will be some loose connective tissue to allow you to separate the minor from the major. And finally, a muscle that we saw uh, previously in our dissection and we cut away from its attachment to the midline, this would be the latissimus dorsi which is just inferior to the teres major. Now the last thing that the reflection of the deltoid allows you to do is to look at the triceps muscle in some detail. The triceps of course has three heads and you can separate two of the heads by finding this cleft between the more tendinous portion of the lateral head of the triceps from the long head of the triceps which is right here. 
The medial head is a little more difficult to find, and we have to look down in the cleft between these two heads, the long and the lateral head, and we're looking down now onto the humerus, and I think you can hear me tapping right against the humerus, and this muscle that you can see right here against the humerus is the medial head of the triceps, and running right along the medial head of the triceps, I can pull up the radial nerve, which is wrapping around the mid-shaft of the humerus. So we've seen two nerves which have been wrapping around the humerus at this point. The radial nerve wraps around the mid-shaft of the humerus, and then proximally, just beneath the head of the humerus, we have the axillary nerve. And finally, we'll be looking at the other constituents of what is called the rotator cuff when we turn the specimen over and look at it from the anterior side. But the SITS muscles, S-I-T-S, uh, that's a eponym which refers to the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and the subscapularis. And we can see we have the supraspinatus here coming to insert onto the humerus. Here is the infraspinatus, the S and the I. Here is the teres minor. These are all components of what is called the rotator cuff because they're all rotators of the humerus and they're all going to be inserting uh, near the head of the humerus on the uh, greater tubercle. Now we're going to turn the specimen over and look at the muscles which are related to the anterior side. All right, we've turned it over. We're looking at the right shoulder from the anterior side. The deltoid is right here. The cephalic vein came up and ran between the margin of the deltoid and the pectoralis major, which I'm holding in my hand. We haven't cut off the anterior portion of the deltoid, although you should. Now, the pectoralis major, a muscle which moves the glenohumeral joint because it attaches to the humerus, is shown right here. You can separate it from the deltoid so that you can move it out of the way and we can look at some of the deeper structures. So I'm going to do that now. Just reflect it. It'll have some pectoral nerves attached to it, which I am going to cut so that we can pull it out of the way entirely. And beneath it is a muscle which is coming off of the anterior thorax from the ribs, which of course have been removed, and it extends proximally to uh, insert into the coracoid process right here of the scapula. Since it does not attach to the humerus, it is a mover of the shoulder girdle, not a mover of the glenohumeral joint. So that the, this muscle, the pectoralis minor, should be evident immediately on the undersurface of the pectoralis major. Now I'm going to pull this out of the way because we're going to take a look at some deeper muscles. One muscle, a mover of the shoulder girdle, which is coming off the uh, ribs. This is the remnant of it, would be the serratus anterior. Notice that I have the arm in a slightly abducted position so that I can get a better look at the depths of the axillary fossa, so to speak. We have the serratus anterior extending back so that it can attach to the vertebral margin of the scapula so that the scapula is laying down like so and the serratus anterior is coming across to insert to its inferior angle and then up along the vertebral border so that when it pulls it will be pulling the entire scapula forward in a protraction movement. Here is the nerve to the serratus anterior, the long thoracic that we saw before. Now in looking down, you pull the brachial plexus and vessels out of the way, and you will be looking at the anterior surface of the scapula. And of course, residing here is the subscapularis. And we haven't dissected it all out. The fibers of this muscle will be extending forward to insert onto the humerus on the lesser tubercle. So this is the last of the SITS muscles. We saw the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor. Those were all posterior muscles. There's one uh, muscle that makes up the SITS group on the anterior surface, and this would be the subscapularis. 
So as we look in here, we have our brachial plexus coming down through here. Posteriorly, we're going to have the subscapularis on the medial wall of the chest going to the scapula will be the serratus anterior. And just for orientation, if you look down here, these are uh, fibers of the latissimus dorsi right here. And then down in here, fibers of the teres major. So these are all the muscles then of the shoulder. And now we'll go on and look at some of the muscles which are associated with the brachium or the arm. Now on the posterior side, we've already seen the radial uh, nerve innervating the triceps muscle back here. The nerve of the anterior compartment of the arm is the musculocutaneous, so that if we pick up one of the muscles of the uh, anterior compartment of the arm, this would be the biceps muscle. The short head of the biceps comes up and attaches to the coracoid process, the same structure that we saw the pectoralis minor attaching to. Although it appears longer, it is really the short head. The long head is disappearing here. It's going up underneath the pectoralis major and it's going to come up to the top side of the uh, humerus and you can dissect that out to follow that. So in fact, this is the long head. Now if you pull the biceps muscle heads aside, you will see that there is a nerve right in here and if you follow that back, it should lead you to the lateral cord. So that here's the lateral cord right there. There's the musculocutaneous entering the anterior compartment of the arm to innervate these muscles. The other muscles that it innervates are the coracobrachialis. This is another mover of the glenohumeral joint, comes from the coracoid process and attaches to the medial side of the humerus down here. Coracobrachialis, of course, also innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. And in fact, you can see the nerve passing right through that muscle uh, in this specimen. The third muscle on the anterior compartment of the arm is one which is on the anterior surface of the lower portion of the humerus down here. And this meaty area right in here uh, denotes the brachialis muscle. And this is the third and last of the muscles which are found on the anterior compartment of the arm, each of them innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. We're now going to look at some of the vessels and nerves uh, of the arm. And we pointed out before how the axillary nerve and the radial nerve, as they wrapped to the posterior compartment, came very close to the bone. The remains, as they traverse the arm, you can see that they are protected by these fleshy components of the muscles that we just studied. So that the ulnar nerve and the median nerve are going to be coming down. They're fairly well protected in the arm. And hence, there's uh, little damage of these nerves in this region. The artery is going to change name. Uh, back here we saw that this was the axillary artery and here are some of the last branches of the axillary. This is the uh, subscapula right here and the posterior humeral circumflex and as you can see right here, here's the posterior margin of our axilla and it's usually marked by uh, passing uh, the teres major muscle in fact so that from this point on down we change our names and it's no longer the axillary, it becomes known as the brachial artery. And the brachial artery is also going to traverse down along with the nerves, still bundled up with the nerves in a neurovascular bundle. And there's really only one major branch that it gives off. And that is shown right here. This is called the deep brachial. The posterior compartment of the arm is going to receive its blood supply uh, in large part from this artery and you can see that it travels back uh, around the mid shaft of the humerus with the radial nerve right here. Now ordinarily the brachial artery uh, traverses on down and it's going to cross the elbow relative to the median nerve so that you can see that here's the biceps muscle right here. This is actually called the bicipital aponeurosis. It helps to keep everything bound down at the uh, antecubital fossa. And anyway, as the 
uh, muscle comes down, the tendon of the biceps muscle is down in here. It's a little bit deeper. And the mnemonic is TAN. That is the placement of these important structures is tendon, then the artery, and then the nerve. And we're talking about the medial nerve right here as it crosses the elbow. Now usually you will find a single vessel coming down. And in fact in this specimen, and some of you will find a uh, similar sort of a scenario, that ultimately the brachial artery is going to come down and at the level of the elbow it's going to give rise to the radial artery and to the ulnar artery. And we have a very, very high bifurcation here. So that bifurcation has taken place actually just below where it gives off the deep brachial. So that this is a little bit out of the ordinary. You usually see a single vessel coming down. And last but not least, in the uh, illustration in the book, you will see that there are numerous vessels that do come off of the uh, brachial to go on either side of the joint. And I think that one thing to keep in mind is that whenever a vessel crosses a joint, it's going to be giving off multiple branches that usually go on either side of the joint. And these are collateral branches to help to provide <coughs> the distal portion of the limb with some blood supply should the main artery become occluded as might occur, for example, during a dislocation. You'll be looking at the joints of the upper limb, and we're going to start first with the shoulder joint. There are two joints up here in the shoulder region. One is the joint between the humerus and the scapula, known as the glenohumeral joint, and the other one is the joint between the clavicle and the acromion of the scapula, known as the acromioclavicular joint. The acromioclavicular joint is a joint that is extremely movable without the associated extracapsular ligaments. The first ligaments that you will see in the acromioclavicular joint are between the clavicle and the acromion process, known as the acromioclavicular ligaments. Those form the capsule around the joint, and you can see this joint here as I move the clavicle back and forth. That's the position of the acromioclavicular joint. Now, the capsule of this joint is fairly weak and is strengthened primarily by some very strong ligaments that go between the coracoid process and the clavicle known as the coracoclavicular ligaments. There are two parts to these, and you can see them both right here. These are very strong ligaments and give the major amount of the stability to the acromioclavicular joint. That's pretty much all you need to do with the acromioclavicular joint. The next thing we're going to do is move on to the glenohumeral joint. The glenohumeral joint is stabilized by a number of ligaments. Uh, first of all, the capsule of the glenohumeral joint is formed by the glenohumeral ligaments, and you will see that in most of the prosections the capsule has been opened up to expose the underlying head of the humerus. In this case the glenohumeral capsule has been opened and you can see it's cut right here and I can stick my probe down inside the joint space uh, where the head of the humerus articulates with the glenoid fossa of the scapula. Notice that the tendon of the long head of the biceps passes right through the joint space on its way to the supraglenoid tubercle. Uh, of the scapula. A couple of other ligaments that are associated with the shoulder joint would be the coracoacromial ligament which forms this nice shelf here which gives some strength to the glenohumeral joint so that the head of the humerus can't be moved superiorly. It hits the coracoacromial ligament and that stabilizes the joint superiorly. We're looking now at the anterior surface of the shoulder joint and what I'm going to do next is to flip this uh, joint over and look inside from the more posterior superior aspect. So as we tip the joint over and open it up to look inside, we're ultimately going to see the glenoid fossa. And we can see here the glenoid fossa where the head of the humerus articulates with the scapula and then there's a dark ring around the glenoid fossa known as the glenoid labrum. This is a cartilaginous ring that helps to broaden that joint slightly and gives it a little bit more stability. That pretty much wraps up the shoulder joint and all that we need to look at. The next thing we're going to do is move down to the elbow and look at the ligaments that are associated with the elbow. Now we've moved down to the elbow joint and we're going to look at a few of the ligaments that stabilize the elbow joint. First of all, the elbow joint is a simple hinge joint uh, that takes place between the ulna and the 
trochlea of the humerus, and you can see that the ulna right here articulating with the trochlea of the humerus, and this is where the hinge action takes place. There's a second joint here that takes place between the head of the radius and the ulna, uh, and this joint allows pronation and supination, and you can always tell the head of the radius because you can see it rolling inside a ligament that holds it in place. The radius articulates with the humerus at the, a point on the humerus known as the capitulum right here. There are three ligaments that we have to look at that stabilize this joint, a lateral ligament and a medial ligament. On the lateral side is the radial collateral ligament seen here, holding the head of the radius up to the humerus uh, on the lateral surface. This ligament prevents a deduction at the elbow joint. On the medial side, there's a similar ligament known as the ulnar collateral or medial collateral ligament, and you can see that ligament right here, a much broader ligament holding the ulna to the humerus, and this ligament prevents a deduction at the elbow joint. A third ligament can be seen when we flip these muscle bellies out of the way. You can see that there is a ligament that holds the head of the radius against the ulna, and this ligament wraps all the way around the head of the radius and is known as the annular ligament and holds the head of the radius in place against the ulna. You can see that when I move the radius inside, that pronation and supination takes place within the annular ligament. Now we're going to look at the, uh, a ligament that holds the radius and the ulna together in place in the forearm. Uh, I want you to notice that we've now looked at, we're now looking at the dorsal surface of the forearm. You can see the thumb side over here. And we've got the ulna and the radius. This ligament is known as the interosseous membrane running between these two bones. And you should note the direction of the fibers of the interosseous membrane. They're running from the ulna distally to the radius more proximally in this direction. Now, when you look at this dissection, uh, try and see how this direction of fibers can uh, prevent the radius from being forced up into the capitulum of the humerus during load bearing at the wrist joint. So this particular ligament helps maintain the position of the radius relative to the capitulum of the humerus. The next thing I'm going to do is move down to the wrist joint and look at the uh, ligament and capsule of the wrist joint. Now we're looking at the wrist joint from its dorsal aspect and again for orientation purposes the radius is right here and the ulna here. The wrist joint is actually two joints and it takes place between the radial carpal joint seen right here and the radial carpal joint consists of the uh, distal end of the radius and the scaphoid and lunate bones and the second part of the wrist joint is between the two rows of carpals, the so-called intercarpal joint, taking place between the capitate and hamate and the scaphoid and lunate. And you can see that uh, joint space right here. Both of these joints allow flexion and extension as well as adduction and abduction. There's not a whole lot to see related to these joints except that the space between the radius and the uh, ulna has a slight disc in it, so there's a disc that curves around between the radius and the ulna right here, and that disc also folds up over the distal end of the ulna and takes up some of the space between the ulna and the lunate bone. So this isn't truly a part of the wrist joint, but it's protected by a cartilaginous disc.